Good morning and welcome to our second webinar that's part of the New York State Virtual Redevelopment Summit. This is Placemaking and the Arts, Integral Elements in Community Engagement. Just a little theatrical effect for you given the theme. So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, many of you probably are at this point because you've seen the kickoff and maybe our other webinars, so I'll be quick about this. Uh, the Center for Creative Land Recycling, our mission is to promote the sustainable, equitable, and responsible reuse of underutilized and environmentally impacted properties. We educate, advocate, and assist and convene stakeholders to revitalize communities through land recycling. We are also uh, EPA's Technical Assistance to Brownfields Provider, or TAB Provider, for 10 states and numerous territories around the country. Okay, uh, so I'm going to glaze over this part. If you haven't heard more about the Center for Creative Land Recycling, I do encourage you to check out our summit kickoff. You all would have received a recording if you registered. Um, but basically what we do is we provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, we organize national webinars, we host workshops and conferences, and we disseminate newslet newsletters and online resources all around the topics of uh, land reuse, redevelopment, and land recycling. I want to give a special thank you to the Upstate Planning Association, Upstate New York chapter for helping us accredit this webinar. That means that AICP certified planners who complete the webinar can receive 1.25 certification maintenance credits. You can see these, uh, the credit number here on the slide. Um, it, it, you should report these credits the same way as you would for a live event, so through your APA CM log. Okay, a little housekeeping before we get started. This webinar does include visuals, but it is very discussion-based. So speakers will present for about 30 minutes uh, and then engage in discussion and Q&A for the remaining time. Uh, you will receive a recording of the webinar about four hours after the webinar concludes, and it will also be posted in our archive uh, online in the next couple weeks. We do really appreciate your feedback. Please respond to the survey following the webinar. There is a couple questions that are specific to the content in this webinar. So we'd love to get your input on that. Engagement opportunities. So uh, we want to make this uh, online summit as in-person-like as possible. So we want to make sure you can engage with speakers. Uh, to ask a question, you can type a question in the lower box of your dashboard. You can mark it to all, uh, to send it to all or to moderators only. You can do that throughout and then we'll be taking questions at the end. Um, I encourage you to utilize the summit exclusive LinkedIn group to continue the conversation with your peers and ask speakers questions directly. We will also be conducting live polls in this webinar. So that's a great opportunity to participate, um, to make your voice heard. We'll be conducting those polls and then we'll share the results live. If you pose a question that we're unable to address, um, I encourage you to use the LinkedIn group to pose that question, try and get the conversation started there. Uh, if not, we will be going through those questions in the, in the next couple of weeks and get those responses back to you. I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to our wonderful and generous sponsors um, without whom this uh, summit would not have been possible. So we really thank them for their support uh, and their leadership in the field of land reuse. Okay. So that's, that's my quick introduction for you. Uh, I'm going to launch a couple polls now before I, uh, I introduce our, our wonderful moderator. So, Let's get the polls going. Here we go. So our first poll is how familiar are, familiar are you with the concept of creative placemaking? This is my first time hearing the term. I've heard of it, but I'm uncertain of what it involves. I am familiar with the fundamentals of creative placemaking, or I can explain creative placemaking to others. So you can vote now. The votes are streaming in. So we're going to get a sense of um, everybody's familiarity with this, uh, with this concept. Excellent. OK. I am going to go ahead and close the poll now and share the results. So it looks like um, the, the majority of you are, are familiar with the fundamentals, uh, but uh, you know, 
are seeking more information. And a quarter of you, this is the first time, your first time hearing the term. So that's really good information to know moving forward. Okay, I'm gonna share the next poll. All right, what are you most interested in hearing about? How creative placemaking can support public art and artists, support affordable housing, creates more opportunities for community engagement, fosters inclusive communities, makes communities safer. Okay, votes are streaming in. Just gonna wait for some more people to vote. Wanna make sure everybody's voices are heard. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. So uh, it looks like most people uh, want to learn more about how creative placemaking creates more opportunities for community engagement and fosters inclusive communities. That's great. We're going to be talking about both of those things quite a bit today. So that's that's excellent. Excellent. And um, many of you didn't. Uh, didn't mention the first or uh, the fifth option, supports public art and artists and uh, makes communities safer, but those are topics we're gonna touch on more. So if you're unfamiliar with how placemaking can do these things, we're gonna talk about it today. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide the poll. Okay, all right. So, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this webinar, uh, Leonardo Vasquez, who is the founding director of the National Consortium for Creative Placemaking. Well, welcome, Leo. Uh, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Ed. Uh, it's appreciate uh, being part of this conversation. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you all for uh, for being with us. Uh, we have we're going to have an excellent conversation uh, today and uh with uh, uh and uh we're gonna hear from you as well through through the chat and through your questions and uh we hope that this presentation will uh, give you uh some very useful inspiring uh and valuable uh knowledge so let me begin by just introducing uh our our speakers um so I'm going to start with uh, Mara Manas. Uh, Mara Manas is the executive director of the New York State Council of the Arts. Uh, she served as the executive director of the Public Theater in New York City and at the Ford Foundation as an economic development officer and PRI, PRI officer in, in the arts. Now, uh, the New York State Council on the Arts is a, a grant-making organization uh, that supports the arts uh, in communities throughout New York State, and she'll be talking more about that. So if we can just go on to the next slide, um, Claire. Uh, Ken Carney um, is the founder and president of Carney Group. Um, he's done a, a number of projects around uh, the New, New York State. Um, and he's, uh, you can see he's a leader in affordable and mixed income housing industry. Uh, uh, really one of the, he's done some really great work that he's gonna be talking about. Um, Mayor uh, Mayor Andre Rainey, uh, Mayor of, of Peekskill, uh, really an exciting uh, small Hudson River town um, that has um, you know had a number of issues um, and has been addressing them uh, through a variety of, of techniques, uh, most notably uh, growing a uh, an arts community and providing uh, more opportunities for uh, a creative development and and for enhancing the arts ecosystem you could see more uh, about his, his work there and i'm sure he'll be uh telling you uh, about some of the great things that uh, that are happening in peak skill um so um why don't we go ahead and i'm going to uh, talk a little bit about creative placemaking to just set set the stage um, I'm glad that many of you are familiar with the the topics. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit more about myself, because I think it's relevant to our conversation together, since I know many of you are real estate and land use professionals, is I began my, I, I've been a, an urban planner.
for over 25 years. I began my career in the 90s as what's known as an expediter, somebody who worked with uh, developers on expediting uh, expediting development applications. And, and much of my work was really being a liaison between the developer and the municipality, or uh, in the case of California, the zoning administrators, the regulators. Uh, so it, it helped me understand kind of what works in terms of making things work faster. And then over time, uh, as community economic development planner, I was involved in a lot of different things, you know, housing, parks, uh, lo you know, local economic development, as, as most planners uh, tend to do. About 10 years ago, I, uh, through a variety of uh, unforeseen circumstances, I started learning about the power of arts uh, in uh, economic and community development. And uh, the more I learned, the more I was uh, astounded at uh, the ability of local arts and culture to enhance uh, the ROI for, for community planning uh, initiatives, uh, for enhancing the, what happens in the community, uh, for leveraging the internal creativity, the internal energy within communities to enhance quality of life, economic opportunity, and the freedom of, and the sense of, of freedom and connectedness to those communities. Now, arts is, you know, the idea of doing arts in development is nothing new. So if we go to the next slide, please. Okay. So, in fact, arts has been around for as long as urban planning has been around or, um, you know, really since the late uh, late 1800s. They started with City Beautiful, municipal art, uh, you know, the statues that are so, con you know, some of which are so controversial today were created during the, this period. And, and that idea was art can make a, a, a city more beautiful, more orderly, uh, enhanced civic values, and, and that, that is true. Um, then, uh, particularly, uh, um, and, and during the same time, we had these private museums developed, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art and uh, other museums starting in the 1870s through the early 1900s, which became anchors in their communities. Um, and so, during the period of urban renewal of 1950s style urban revitalization, we had uh, an expansion of cultural facilities. So uh, the example you see at your bottom left there, Lincoln Center is the quintessential example of a, uh, a cultural facility that was built to be an anchor, uh, to attract wealth, to retain people in cities, because as you know, the suburbs were, were uh, declining at that time in terms of population, in terms of other you know, quality of life factors. Um, these cultural facilities, though, uh, and particularly in the case of Lincoln Center, uh, involved really moving people out were, you know, largely designed for the wealthiest, for the, if not the 1%, at least the 10% um, in, in communities. And unfortunately, uh, had created uh, or perpetuated the idea that arts are for the wealthy. Now, arts are certainly not for the wealthy uh, only, um, but this kind of development did that. Now, in the 90s, we had a, a, a new approach. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, creative, if you're familiar with Richard Florida's work, Creative Class, and that that was the idea that it's not just about doing nice things, putting you know nice pieces of art, but rather about bringing what is known as the creative class or so so and quote unquote creatives um, into communities, attracting them. And we see this now, you know, developing lofts and all these things to bring people in, um, which, you know, work, has, has worked in a number of cases in terms of redeveloping, uh, um, of enhancing wealth in, uh, you know, in, in neighborhoods, in downtown areas, et cetera. Um, but again, the problem with the creative class model, it suffers from some of the same 
issues that the cultural facilities development model that is that it, it has helped to perpetuate gentrification and in fact it has uh, perpetuated an idea again that that the arts that these things culture arts and culture are simply for uh, uh, you know weird people and rich rich people um, that certainly I don't that certainly wasn't Richard Flores intent um, and uh, when he wrote the book, but uh, that's become a result. So what's the alternative then? Um, if we want to be, uh, uh, if we want to be inclusive, if we want to address what's going on in in the world right now, and um, you know, it, you could see right now actually with the issue of statues being toppled, how important it is to think about this stuff because what we see is. Um, art is not just something, public art and, and cultural expression is not just something that's sort of nice to have or decorative. Um, it is something that people take seriously at a, a deep level. Um, it's a reflection of the, uh, of, uh, of the community. And we see uh, so many statues being torn down because they no longer reflect the, the the values of or or they never reflected the values of some people in the community and now those people have who have more of a voice are now taking down uh, those statues um, and you know the issue with gentrification um, you know the thing about gentrification is it happens and it's been happening but people are recognizing it more. And if you've seen what happened in East Los Angeles and other communities, uh, gentrification is a show that they know and they don't like it. And uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of how we work with communities, uh, it's no longer enough to just sort of plant something on a paste, you know, paint something on a wall or just plant a statue somewhere or just take a you know, a, a build the building and just say, it's for culture. Um, it's really about working with people. And that's where creative placemaking comes in. Creative placemaking, uh, if we can go on to the next slide. Uh, creative placemaking is about working with arts and artists and culture, local culture and cultural organizations, cultural professionals. Um, it involves, you know, on on the surface, it does create. Uh, you do see more uh, cultural activities. Uh, you see more events. You see more art. Um, but that is the tip of the iceberg. Creative placemaking is more about how you work with within this creative and cultural ecosystem. Um, so it's about process, not just the product. Um, and I'm going to say this as a planner, as somebody who's worked with real estate developers. Um, for too long, too many of us um, have treated artists, cultural professionals, as essentially the decorators of communities. Um, and what creative placemaking says is, no, that that is not good. That's just tokenism. That's you know, it it it's super. It literally becomes superficial. Um, you artists as co-designers as co-creators artists and cultural professionals if you work with them uh, respectfully if we work with them well um, if you pay them pay the people who are doing work um, your you know the people that you work with can be your sherpas can be your uh, uh, your guides your um, uh, the, your facilitators your teachers your your moni monitors um, the the place keepers as well as the the place makers um, and creative place making the the great thing about it is it's a holistic and adaptive approach it's looking way beyond just surface what's on the ground it's about understanding a place and surfacing the creativity that's there I don't like using the you know, uh, a lot of people use the term creatives. Now, I don't like using the term creatives because everybody is creative. 
you know there's not one person this is the problem with the florida's model is that you know we've been sort of led to believe that, that there's certain some people that are just they're the creative class and we need to bring those people in and kind of that means everybody else is not creative that is absolutely not the case there is all this untapped wealth and resources and energy uh in this community you know, and creative placemaking uh is, is one of the most powerful vehicles for unearthing that and um this if we can go on to the next slide these kinds of things can help uh you know help communities heal which is so important right now can help communities recover economically um you know after katrina and after sandy uh the arts were among the first industries to come back we should expect that there's going to be a main street recession that is going to last longer than the overall you know overall recession in the economy and one thing that i always tell my friends in in elected in, in city halls is that you can buy almost anything on the internet except an experience and arts and culture is you know are the experiences that that people by and becoming more resilient because there's always going to be something else today it's a pandemic uh tomorrow it's going to be something else but we can help our communities bounce heal and recover faster by helping them become more resilient now one last thing i'm going to say before i turn it over to our, our panelists um is that uh when we talk about arts and culture well i'm also talking about the producers of those works and we have to care as much about the artists the cultural professionals uh the cultural organizations as we do about the product that they, we need to protect and enhance those ecosystems and mara is going to talk more more about that uh but it is important and last thing i'm going to say and this is so important pay the artists Pay the cultural professionals. If you if they're working with you, um, if they're asking them to do something, pay them as you would any other vendor. Do not do not say they're going to get paid in exposure. Okay, you would not do this to the you know to the people who are bringing in glass or concrete or anything. Um, you know, make sure you respect uh, those you know, your artists and cultural professionals the way that you would want to be uh, respected. So with that in mind, uh, let's turn it over to the, um, uh, to, to our panelists. So, thank, so let's start with, with Mara Manis. Thank you so yep. much, Leo. It's, a, it's really a pleasure to be with you guys today and to hear um, so much of what, you, what Leo shared is what we uh, believe and practice every day in our work as grant makers in the arts. Um, so uh, New York State Council in the Arts, also known as NISCA, um, has had a bu budget of roughly $41 million, and we provide support to 2,300 organizations across all 62 counties. And many of our grantees are very small organizations with budgets of under $500,000. And this underscores what Leo so eloquently shared, which is that um, the small organizations are the ones that really provide the, the health and um, and drive um, so much of what constitutes healthy communities in those places. Um, over the last three years, NISC has provided $30 million in capital funding as well to 89 organizations, including Prattsville Art Center, the Boys and Girls Club of Newburgh, and the Albright Knox Museum. And while we know that the arts are critical to um, a critical, powerful, and powerful economic engine, um, we also want to talk more today about uh, how they are a critical driver of health of people and places. Um, the sector constitutes 8% of the state's economy, contributes $120 billion annually, and accounts for almost half a million jobs. Um, obviously, this year, because of COVID, the numbers will be slightly different. However, we know that the arts are linked to the vitality of workforce, tourism, and hospitality, as well as communities, and will be critical to our state's recovery. We've also seen the arts, especially here at NISCA, and you can find these on our website, we've seen that many organizations have had to pivot 
to um, uh, online platforms. And in some ways, this is providing uh, opportunities to reach new audiences and explore new earned income models. Um, but even after the physical reopenings, the challenges around digital capacity will remain. And especially as we think about how do we build uh, spaces for the presentation of these works in a hybrid model and what do artists need, what else do they need in their spaces to create that kind uh, on that kind of platform? Um, as Leo said, um, successful creative placemaking is a unifier. It, uh, it creates a cohesive purpose and serves both artists and community members equally. Um, and back to what also Leo said, what do artists need? Uh, so artists need space, they need income, they need community. Community means fellow artists, local businesses, and institutions. Uh, thank you so much for that next slide. Um, uh, actually, you could go to the next slide, too. Thank you so much. Um, and we can go one more. Thank you so much. Okay, great. I'll remember to to cue you. Uh, so um, they need so space, income, community. They need audience, right? Um, so in addition to supporting the development of their work, how can we create an environment for their work to be seen? I also want to uh, mention that this speaks to how do we define audiences? You know, there's many, um, uh, so much, so many people who are involved in the arts are we can are sort of non-traditional arts audiences, right? They may not be arts collectors. They may not. Um, go to museums all the time, but in fact, they, they, they experience arts, and in, especially on the local level, that experience of arts creates more engagement, more community trust, and more cohesion. Um, also, I want to just uh, note that um, I think it's important to, to underscore the fact that placemaking can, the word placemaking can sometimes be understood. So successful placemaking, as Leo said, um, it's not about imposing external vision. It's really activating what's already organic in soil. Um, and uh, so a couple of bullets to share. Uh, next slide, please, about um, some research that's been done around uh, the impact of creative placemaking. So the NEA um, has, a, has a study that showed that uh, arts Arts anchored revitalization res results in seniors and families and young working people moving back into central cities. Um, and similarly, another study by UPenn showed that uh, communities with access to cultural activities have higher property values, um, have more engagement of people in all civic activities, and also have a higher percentage of students that do well in school, which is pretty cool. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, we talk about how do the arts achieve this, right? The arts are a connected tissue. The arts create shared experiences. Um, and uh, it's really whether you're, whether you're making the work or experiencing the work or making the work together, um, it's this experience that across different populations build these successful and meaningful connections. And in fact, um, this year NISCA is launching with um, the uh, so, so slightly it's a related topic, but um, with the Department of Aging, a creative aging initiative in senior centers. Um, and um, the goal of that is to, um, to continue to prove that uh, regular arts making um, actually improves senior uh, elderly, older people's health, um, both their mental health and their physical health. And there's research on that too. So it's, it's a really exciting area that's developing quickly. Um, so in, in doing this art together, whether you're experiencing the art, making the art, or a maker of the art, um, you're pr it's promoting a kind of strengthening of trust, of bonds, engenders empathy, and, and ultimately accountability. So everyone's looking after each other as well um, and feeling very connected. I'm going to show you a couple of, uh, share with you a couple of um, few projects that we have supported. Um, in different ways. Um, so we're going to move to uh, Cambridge in Washington County. So this is Hubbard Hall uh, Education Center, which is a nonprofit rural community multi-art center. So it's really interesting. So what Hubbard Hall did was that they, well, they <clears throat> they offer many wonderful kinds of, <coughs> excuse me, programming in the arts, um, whether it's dance or theater, <coughs> and they partnered with Cambridge Community Partners to purchase and restore three freight yard buildings uh, behind their venue to create both uh, year-round education spaces, but what it turned into was something much, much more. So um, the budget of um, 
of this organization's half a million dollars. Its annual economic impact is more than that, and it, that's nearly three times the Village of Cambridge budgets of $200,000. Um, so what do they? What more do they do? Um, next slide, please. Uh, Hubbard Hall. Um, so they clear snow off the sidewalks. They share their performance space with local high school. Um, they provide consultation for local and for-profit businesses, um, which has created dozens of jobs, provided job training. Um, and it is um, the reason uh, that many people have chosen to move to Cambridge. Um, that local businesses that houses um, and has actually attracted businesses to come to Cambridge include the Roundhouse Bakery Cafe, the Valley, um, Valley Artisans Market, and a brewing company. And, um, and the executive director of Herbert Hall says, you know, hundreds of residents, especially young professionals, have told me that Herbert Hall was the number one reason that they moved to Cambridge. So really cool story there. Um, next, we're going to head over to Albany. Um, I love this project. Uh, I've been there. It's just so inspiring. So, you know, Albany, this is Albany Barn, the creative arts incubator, um, community arts center, and artist live work space. It's an Arbor Hill neighborhood, which has been an area of disinvestment for a long time, since the 70s. And it's part of the, um, the uh, Upstate Revitalization Initiative and in partnership with the local housing authority, the Albany Barn uh, redeveloped an abandoned school called, uh, formerly called St. Joseph's. Um, and they made this into 22 low-cost live-work residences and 13,000 square feet of multi-tenant um, arts incubator space. Uh, and that's called the barn. So they, so in addition to serving the residents, uh, they also host large school activities, outdoor arts programming. They recently partnered with the Albany Center Gallery and the Albany Parking Authority to create murals throughout the city. And actually, um, it's this model um, that has led them to launch um, a, um, uh, next slide please, a, a makerspace in uh, Schenectady called the Electric City Barn. Um, so that's, um, and that provides studio spaces specialized to support artists, craftsmen, and creative businesses. Um, and Electric City will connect, does connect makers and community members through project-based programming and creative workforce training. And I'll say that this is, uh, while it doesn't provide housing, this is adjacent to an affordable housing um, uh, building and building. So, um, so they're getting both there. Um, from Albany, we're going to head down to Harlem, to East Harlem, um, uh, where this is a, you probably could guess, this is a former school. Um, and uh, El Barrio Operation Fight Back was an organization with decades long relationship with their community in East Harlem, and they partnered with art space projects to develop this uh, long abandoned landmark public school into 90 units of affordable housing for artists, uh, which opened in 2014. In addition to providing affordable housing for artists, El Barrio also houses four other arts and cultural institutions. And El Barrio responds directly to the needs of the community. 25% of the households are defined as very low income. And most of the community has limited arts exposure to, limited exposure to arts and culture. And, um, and so, they, so what the building also provides is free or low cost arts programming for kids. It has uh, many um, relationships uh, with local community, uh, senior citizens centers and communities and provides uh, art making there. Um, uh, they also, we provided, NISCA provided um, a capital grant to help them convert their community space, which is 2000 square feet into a multifunctional space. So this conversion was seen as an opportunity to accommodate a, even a wider breadth of artists and draw more educators and social entrepreneurs and non-traditional audiences um, into their events. Um, I'll say that you know, in visiting this, they have many uh, open um, uh, open studio uh, tours you can take, and uh, which are really fantastic. But you know, their community space is a sprung floor, so dance can cre be created there. And you just feel when walking through this that it's such a um, a rich um, and uh, both a both a rich but incredibly inspiring place to be. And you can see how the neighborhood is sort of activated by its presence. Um, and uh, El Barrio, one of the, the leaders noted that when a community comes together for shared experiences, they develop ties on a cultural level, and these types of connections serve to foster a healthy existence for all. Going back exactly to what Leo shared with us earlier. 
Um, we're now going to move over to Buffalo. Um, and I have to say, I haven't uh, been, sorry, next slide, please. Let's head over to Buffalo. So this is, this is kind of amazing. I haven't been here, but I plan to go uh, as soon as I can. Um, so this is, uh, so this is Torn Space Theater. Obviously, this is the theater uh, came after the grain, the screen silos were abandoned. So this is a great example of creative placemaking acting as a unifier in a disconnected place. Um, so th this is Torn Space Theater applying creative placemaking practices to activate existing assets, attract regional community and tourists to an underserved area, and expose residents to art free of charge. So out of 22 theaters in Buffalo, Torn Space Theater is one of two, one is only one of two located in the undeveloped east side, uh, which used to have a non-existent arts audience. And the area has experienced a loss of 50% of the population since 1950s. Um, and the area has been deemed a main street within the, the New York State HCR program. Um, and what we know is that this company is known for its interactive and immersive um, performances at Silo City. I think you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, so here you can see those, some of those performances. Um, and um, the, so Silo City obviously is an incredible, its own incredible reuse project and it's reimagining a 13.5 acre complex of the abandoned grain silos. Um, and Torn Space has been in residence since 2013. Um, so having, having become an anchor in this uh, area, um, it's now successfully bringing new audiences to the east side and, um, and reimagining um, their work. And we have provided uh, uh, support to Torn Space to expand its impact through a program called Neighborhood, which is a community-wide site-based performance festival that reimagines the Broadway Fillmore neighborhood in Buffalo's east side as a vast performance stage, if you will. And so there, the theater will use light, video mapping, community members as performers, and architecture and sound design to activate this neighborhood and other surrounding areas in Western New York. Um, this is a pretty exciting example of something that you probably wouldn't imagine could happen at a place like a grain silo, but also shows the, imagine, the ingenuity and creativity of artists when they're, giving up, when they're given opportunities to, to activate and reactivate places. Um, I wanted to close with a quote from um, someone, uh, uh, Tambra Dillon, she runs the, Hop the Hudson Opera House. She says that, you know, there's real value to the investment being made. I think that's important to view the arts as an industry. The same way uh, travel and tourism are valued. The cultural assets are not only what drives tourism, but creates jobs and greatly contributes to the quality of life for ordinary citizens in the place they call home. It's a really great to be with you today. I'm really looking forward to the conversation, your questions. And um, with this, uh, it's my pleasure to turn this over to uh, Ken Carney. Thank you, Mara. Thank you for that introduction. Great to be here today with everybody. Um, just following up on what uh, Leo and Mara have stated already, we are uh, developers. We develop um, downtowns. Uh, we focus on DRI communities, communities that have been successful in the uh, New York State's uh, dynamic uh, downtown revitalization initiative, where communities compete against other communities for uh, a $10 million uh, funding, which will be used to revitalize their downtowns. Many downtowns in some of our smaller urban centers throughout New York State uh, have areas that uh, exhibit urban blight. Um, they are areas that have been disconnected uh, from other parts of, of the community. And, uh, you know, they've lost their prominence. Uh, our downtowns uh, should define a community. They're the fabric of, of a community. And at times, um, you know, these communities are defined by their main streets or, or downtowns. Uh, we have several uh, projects throughout New York State, but our model is to combine affordable art lofts with mixed income housing on a two thirds, one third ratio, and also bring in some retail to create uh, additional foot traffic and to create uh, a synergy and energy um, that the artists bring and uh, bring that synergy and energy into uh, a downtown and help reconnect 
that area to other parts of the city and remove a stigma or a perception issue. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of working with uh, Mayor Andre Rainey in Peekskill on the Lost on Main project. Uh, that project was a vacant lot in the middle of Main Street, and uh, there was a perception problem with, with Main Street. It was a vacant lot, a litter, it was a brownfield site. Uh, people would cross the street to avoid walking in front of that. And now we've introduced these 50 dynamic affordable art lofts with uh, other mixed income housing together with four retail stores. And it's created uh, a, a, an energy that has changed the, the perception. Not much has changed on the block. It's still a great block. It was always a great block, but the perception has changed and the stigma's changed. And you have people coming down to Main Street that maybe weren't coming down a few years ago. Uh, you'll see a slide later where one of the store owners it was actually a graduate from Peekskill High School, and he always wanted to come back to Peekskill. Him and his wife had a business outside of Peekskill in a neighboring town, a suburban town. And um, when they heard about this, they wanted to come down to Main Street, and uh, they thought it could work. Well, it's worked very well, and uh, they've increased uh, the traffic, and people from outside of Peekskill are now coming down, uh, and it's very, very, uh, very, very exciting. Uh, I had the pleasure of giving uh, Mayor Rainey a tour uh, throughout uh, uh, the Law Summit project. This is a, a loft, um, and here's here's the mayor and I um, meeting. Mayor Rainey, why don't you? Sorry to interrupt you, Ken. Mayor Rainey, why don't you go ahead and turn your webcam on at this time? Just want to make. There we go. Excellent. Thank Sorry you. to interrupt you, Ken. Please, both of you, continue. Sure. So uh, I had the pleasure of uh, uh, meeting uh, the mayor at the uh, at the development to meet some of our tenants. Um, you have a, a local a musician over here uh, on the left and, and his space. And uh, uh, we have the Nixons uh, below them. Mr. Nixon is, is a, uh, a local veteran. Um, his wife is, is an artist and, and they qualified. Um, the downtown uh, to the lower uh, right, that's the gentleman who opened the uh, the business. It was a graduate of Peak School High School uh, to come back. So it's been a very uh, exciting, uh, rewarding uh, project. We we went with our product. What we do is we go over the top um, to to attract the artist into an area. We, we built 16 foot high ceiling lofts, and uh, what we found is that. Uh, some of the artists, musicians, and makers um, will they, they gravitate to uh, to areas that that may have a uh, a stigma or perception or or uh, may be perceived as urban blight. So it's worked. Uh, it's it's worked extremely well. Peekskill has had a very strong artist community uh, for years. Uh, we're taking this model and and, uh, and using it uh, in other areas in New York State, which I'll get back to, but. Um, I just wanted to introduce uh, uh, Mayor Andre Rainey of the great city of Peekskill. Yes, Don, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Carney. It's been a pleasure working with you. I just want to start off by saying thank you all for allowing me to be a part of this panel today. I finally figured out my uh, my microphone and video for this webinar, so uh, thank you sincerely. Um, but yes, you know, uh, in, in the city of Peekskill, the diversity is what's been able to make our city thrive and to get to where it's from. And I. I certainly want to say that the direction of bringing the artists to the community was um, uh, first initiated by uh, Mayor Fran Gibbs in the early 2000s. Um, you know, she really had this vision of of making the city of Peekskill an artistic city uh, with a community full of artists and creative thinkers. And you know, one of the ideas that she really, really pushed forward was uh, making the city of Peekskill one of the different cities as far as the river towns go. And if you look up and down the river towns. Up the Hudson Valley, especially on the um, uh, on the northern on the southern side, most of the cities have you know residential developments on their riverfront. You know, um, you know high rises. You know, maybe 16, eight, eight to 12 floors of high rises on their on their riverfronts. And ours is an open green space where we've created trailways, um, and we have one of the longest trailways in the county actually on our our, our riverfront. And um, you know, we the the artists that have come to the to the community. You know, thanks to developers like uh, Mr. Carney. Um, have really contributed a lot to our, our our city's character, you know. And um, when you come to the city of Peekskill, 
and you get off the train station, the first thing you see is a beautiful open green space and you see an artist sculpture of a diver. I, I mentioned this one because this is one of my favorite ones on the, on, the, on the riverfront green. And I tell people, when you go to Las Vegas, you go to the Strip. When you go to Manhattan, you go to Times Square. When you come to Peekskill, you go to the diver. You know, and it's that actual sculpture was donated by an actual artist from the community. You know, so and there are numerous of sculptures and different designs throughout the entire city. Um, that have really, really made this a cohesive city to recognize diversity. And you know, one of the other artists that we have living in an artist loft as well has um, this, this this huge posting um, on one of our parking garages has what matters. And it asks people what matters to people, what matters to you as as an individual. You know, is is it family? Is it is it is it religion? Is it God? Is it money? Is it is it success? Is it you know is it character? Is it you know whatever, is it friendships, you know, and there's a lot of different things that they, they put on this actual um, um, uh, billboard that's in the downtown area. But this comes from giving artists a place, not only a place to live in an affordable economy, but a place to actually express themselves within their community. And that has brought so much out of the city of Peekskill and the character of our city has really been able to thrive specifically on the diversity. And when you welcome artists in a city like, in a city this size, especially, they're more active, they're more involved. And, you know, for me personally, it's been an experience for me because, you know, the, the artists literally live, Ken's project is literally across the street from City Hall. So uh, post pandemic, uh, I got to meet a lot of these artists just because I'm right across the street, whether they come by the office and say, oh, you know, as an artist, I've never been in the City Hall. I've never been in the mayor's office. You know, I've been able to meet so many artists literally because they're right across the street from me. But that's the type of relationships that you build when you give artists an opportunity to thrive and you know affordable housing for artists like Ken, like like Mr. Carney's I keep calling him King because that's my friend um, but Mr. Carney's project has really opened up you know the scene for for creativity it's opened up opportunities for our youth and our children you know when we do our um, city the city of Peacefield is well known for our festivities our, our parades and our, our gatherings for different cultural events and things like that and the artists just contribute so much more to it and um again giving them the opportunity of a place to stay where they can afford in a city the size of peace skills it gives an opportunity to get more involved and you can actually see their involvement more than you can you know hear people just talk about it so it's been an honor and a pleasure working with um mr carney on this project and others and you know i look forward to more thanks so much mayor Certainly. so uh, from from peak skill uh we took the idea and we went to uh poughkeepsie this was another qualified census track an area of high poverty uh, disinvestment that was disconnected from Main Street. It was right between Main Street and the waterfront. So we built 70 units, uh, but the centerpiece of it is the corner store. It's a uh, uh, 6,000 square foot space where we built a brewery. And the brewery has acted as, as a back. It's attracted a, a lot of people back down to this neighborhood who haven't been there in, in a long time. That's called Queen City Lofts. Um, and uh, we went back to Beacon. I started my career in Beacon 30 years ago to West End Lofts. Um, that's a project uh, adjacent to City Hall. This is an interior view of Queen City Law. Um, when we went down to Beacon, um, here's West End Lofts and Beacon. This is adjacent to City Hall. They uh, have a very strong uh, artist community uh, as well. This again was uh, uh, affordable art loss with uh, uh, mixed income on uh, the non-artist uh, units. Um, we have now, we're now focused on the DRI community. I'm happy to say that Peekskill was named the DRI winner last year. I, um, I take a little credit for it, Mayor. Uh, I think that we, uh, I think that our project brought some, some attention and synergy to downtown. Um, so the DRI came after our project, but what we're doing now is working with communities who have been awarded uh, DRIs. Um, upstate, we're working in, um, uh, the next slide is, this is the interior of uh, West End Lofts and Beacon. Uh, and the, this is a view from the apartments of the Mid-Hudson Bridge, beautiful. This is Crannell Square. This project is a, another project in Poughkeepsie that ha will have a mix of uh, middle income, affordable units, and some uh, art lofts. We're breaking ground on this uh, next month. This is in the neighborhood uh, further up from Queen City Loft. Again, we're looking to connect that now with the neighborhood of Queen City Loft and the waterfront. And these projects serve as, as that, uh, that synergy to create uh, 
different parts of the community that have been uh, disconnected uh, from each other. And then as we go further up north, uh, I don't know what's next. So Copper City Loft is in rural New York. This is a DRI priority project located right across from City Hall, the City Hall Green. We work very closely with Rome. Uh, we will be submitting that um, in uh, very shortly uh, for funding through HCR. The slide earlier was on the Capitol Theater in Rome, which is another key component of their DRI program that's right down the street. And we're looking to work with local art groups to uh, uh, build that. This is our next project uh, working in uh, the great city of Peak Skills. Uh, we call it Solo, south of Louisa Street. It's a com combination of affordable uh, housing. We are going to have uh, some units with a, a preference for artists. It's in a light industrial area that's uh, a brownfield site that's been uh, derelict for many years. And we're looking again to reconnect this with the waterfront that the mayor spoke about uh, and, and the train station. We've used a, uh, a new look, an industrial look that we feel is going to do very well. Next, I think, is Deet Street. Deet Street Loft is in Oneonta, another DRI project, DRI priority project. What's unique here, it's 64 units of uh, lofts and middle income. We've worked with Hartwick College. Hartwick College has been trying to get downtown Oneonta for years. So uh, working with the DRI program and the people at uh, uh, Mohawk Valley ESD, uh, we are going to build a grain innovation center, which is actually doing testing for various foods and beverages by Hartwood College as part of our development. It's very, very exciting. Um, we're hoping uh, this is viewed favorably uh, for funding uh, this year. Uh, we also have a project in um, up in Lockport. We bought a factory, the old, uh, made the radiators for the GM plants, Harrison Radiator. It's another DRI priority project uh, that's moving forward. And we've just identified a site. We've been in Gloversville, New York for the last uh, year. We finally identified a site that's the perfect site to connect Main Street with the, with the, the park and, and stream and, and City Hall. And again, you just need that right site. You need the site that's it's like a mouth with a couple of teeth missing. You need to build that bridge. And that's, that's what we look to do. And uh, the, the synergy that these uh, developments create, it's, it's great. Um, I, I love it. I was getting a little tired of, of uh, development, but this uh, I'm re-energized. It's uh, uh, to see the energy and the diversity, and it, you know, it's 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 really been great. But the whole concept started in Peak Skill. Without Peak Skill, this concept doesn't go, and, and it doesn't get traction. And if for anybody who hasn't been to Peak Skill lately, please get down there. It's it's just so great to just walk around the streets and the restaurants and the shops and the people. It's it's just a wonderful, wonderful place. So. Um, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, and Ma I guess Mara, if you uh, wouldn't mind joining us back on the video here. Um, okay. Um, Great, terrific. Okay, well, thank you all. This, this was this was so great. Um, and, and by the way, for those of you folks from uh, you know smaller towns or rural areas, I mean, the, the, you saw a lot of images related to urban areas, but but this works just as well in uh, rural areas and and smaller communities. In fact, the uh, one of the more famous, uh, more successful arts communities is in East Aurora, which is a village. Uh, just n near um, near Buffalo, so uh, the Roycroft community. So, um, I I'm going to just have a couple of questions, and then we want to open it up to the uh, uh, to to everybody else in terms of their questions. Um, so we had about 70% of our uh, participants today said they were interested in how creative placemaking can help with uh, building more inclusive communities and uh, community engagement. So uh, my my first question is. Um, how can placemaking projects and initiatives enhance community vibrant vibrancy uh, throughout the land reuse process, not just at the end? In other ways, in other words, how do how do we how do you integrate it throughout the, the this work throughout the work and not just you know stick it all at the at the end you know once everything's done? 
Well, I, I think uh, the DRI, the Downtown Revitalization Initiative uh, process, uh, would, would invite um, the, uh, the creative thinkers to get involved in, in their plan. The downtown uh, plan is submitted once a year for communities who aren't funded. They get another chance at it. And I think to engage the artist groups at that time, Leo, is, is vitally important. And then once a community is funded uh, through the DRI process, there's, uh, as Mayor Rainey is going through now in Peekskill, there's many public uh, hearings and process um, on where the money is actually going to be spent. But that's a great idea. I think they should get in early uh, for these downtown uh, revitalization initiative plans. Great. Thanks again. Mayor or Mara? M Mara, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Mara, you're, you're, mm -hmm. we can't hear you. You're muted. Uh, Mayor, Mayor, would you like to say a few words while Mara? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I'm gonna. I, 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 no, I second with Lou. Okay. Yeah. Um. I, yeah, I would add that. You go. Go ahead, Mara. You can. Yeah, we we can hear you now. Can hear me. Yep. Yes. Oh, now we now we can't. It's like cutting it's, in and out. There's something You're wrong. Um, uh, what, Mayor, why don't you go ahead, Mara? I, maybe yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll just say I, I, I second uh, uh, Mr. Carney's comments, and you know, uh, you know, you know, philanthropy and, and government, you know, working hand in hand is is what really helps, um, you know, the, the create these initiatives. And you know, when you when you have in a, in a small city like Peekskill, you know, with with our architecture, um, it's almost it's almost a, it's almost a given. You know, the 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 diversity here. You know the community engagement here. You know the 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 activists here. The you know the local artists who who just found ways and find ways to get more involved. You know they they appreciate these initiatives that we create. And this I mean I, I, this creates a lot of youth engagement. You know um, you know a lot of creativity when it comes to some of these festivities. And you know that you know one of the things that can uh, Mr. Carney mentioned before is you know this attracts different development as well. You know so. The artist law of being in the downtown, it created an opportunity for the artists to thrive. It created an employment opportunity um, for, for people to actually open up stores, which creates job opportunity, which creates attraction to more developers who want to come in town. You know, and that's 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 the ultimate goal for the for the government of the city. When we work with projects like this, we want to see not just one community thrive, but different communities. So you have the business community thriving, you have the artist community thriving, you have education, the school system community thriving, because it gives everybody an opportunity to succeed. So these type of projects really help that out. And uh, Mayor, just to follow up on that, um, is, is there a story? Is there like an example that you could give uh, folks here about? You know, oh, this is a great example of how artists. Uh, are oh, certainly, yeah, yeah. I would love to. So I'm gonna use Mr. Carney's uh, project specifically because it was, it was the first time, and I, I have children. I, I, have, I have children. It was the first time my son ever got to display his art in a building of importance. <laughs> So uh, when Ken came in, he allowed all of the artists in the community, in the school district, uh, whoever, any any young artist, I should say, in the school district, first grade, second grade, to hang their art up as the first project of the new artist laws. And all of these six and seven year old kids hung their art up and that just made their parents proud, made the school proud, made the, uh, made the kids proud. And on, on, in addition, you know, uh, uh, members of, of the actual artist lost that live there, they've donated to the football teams to help get equipment for our school districts. They've helped um, with the youth borough and things like that. But at the same time, you have some of the local artists who actually open stores right there in the artist lost. And we had one store that was open recently, and she only allowed local artists work to be sold in her store which is fantastic. And you also had um, diversity. This definitely brought diversity. You have an African-American business there. It's Ty's Bread Basket Bakery. And the homeless shelter literally comes to the Bread Basket Bakery and they hang up their artwork in the actual Bread Basket Bakery. You know what I mean? So these little things come from one idea from Mr. Carney. And it, it really creates inclusiveness. And like I said before, that cohesiveness and our diversity in the city, which everybody gets to, you know, everybody gets a chance and an opportunity to succeed. Th thank you, Mayor. That's a that's a great uh, uh, example. Uh, Mara, are you are you are you back with us, Mara? Are you? Oh, I don't know. I'm so sorry. We, we can't. Oh, having trouble hearing Mara. you. I'm, 
Yeah, you may be experiencing some network connectivity issues. Mara, why don't you go ahead and try turning off your video to um, put your system under a little less stress. Um, and then uh, we'll see if that, that includes your audio connectivity. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, Mara, if you can hear oh, us, uh, uh, feel, can can you hear us, Mara? Okay, let's try that. Feel free to jump in because I can't see you. So, so. Yeah. I can't hear me. I'm sorry. You're, yeah, can you're, you hear me? There we go. Yes, yes, we can hear you Still now. Still choppy? Yes. Yep. No, no, no. Go, go, go ahead. It's it's working now. So okay, please, can please you go ahead. hear me pretty clearly? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Just, just keep, keep going ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I was just, I was just. Gonna... Okay. Great. Um, no, I was just going to say, uh, in terms of really going back to the point that you had made, Leo, uh, earlier on, which is, um, how do you, which is involving artists from the beginning and also finding out what are artists doing there, you know, before you even arrived. What, what have they been doing? How, what are they been, how have they been creating? So not just uh, allowing them to. Uh, or inviting them, which is fantastic, into your process, but finding out about their process, which could be um, the base of how what what else you know moves forward in the bigger picture. Okay, um, l let me ask you something. You know, because we talked about respecting artists, and what what does it mean? What does it look like to for developers, planners, other real estate to respect? artists uh, and by extension cultural professionals in the process of of land use development what does it look like uh, so i i think it's it's um you said respect but i you know i think that it's also about just listening and hearing about what they have been doing what's been going on there before you know before the plans are developed so that you're really building upon um, work and, and um, that they can be that they have, may have been sharing with audiences or that they can share more broadly. Um, I think tapping into what they're already doing is seems critical to um, creating that bigger plan. Okay, great. Th thank, thank you, Mara. We we got most mo most of that. Uh, so I hope everybody else. Uh, Something tells me you're not hearing me in real time. No, no, no. Well, we're, we're hearing you. Uh, and, and folks, by the way, we've Sorry been practicing you. and practicing, and this is the first time this has ever happened. So, so apologies. Um, but uh, uh, Ken or Mayor Mayor Rainey, is there anything else you'd like to add on on that about how respecting artists and or anything what you know following up on what Mara just said? All right. Ken, you want to take the take the floor on that? Sure. Um, <laughs> what what I have learned, but what my son Sean and I uh, have learned uh, during the last five or six years is we, we've learned a lot. Uh, the um, when uh, Los Amain and Peekskill opened, we tried to get the artists or, organized to get involved. Peekskill has an open studio weekend, and uh, we tried to get them uh, engaged, and uh, it was rather easy. Uh, we called two or three uh, strong personalities and, and we sponsored them with some money and uh, they created uh, shows that, were, that was just incredible. Uh, every half an hour they had different artist groups uh, uh, performing uh, in our courtyard, uh, on our rooftop, uh, in our lobbies. And um, so I, I, personally I've learned, uh, I've learned a little bit about the mindset uh, of, a, uh, of a maker, uh, of an artist, a musician. And uh, I'm, I yield, <laughs> I yield, uh, I, 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 wear the hat, I wear the hat of a landlord, but I yield when it comes to, I just go, okay, uh, how much you need, uh, because I, I really don't want to uh, put my negativity uh, in, into, the, in, into the process, but we're very proud of the synergy that they've created at Peekskill, and, and the Open Studio Weekend in 2019 was, was such a proud, proud moment. We had over 240 people come through our building to view the art and meet our artists and everything else. And it was just an incredible, it was an, an incredible uh, experience for me. Okay. 
Yeah. And I, I had to be very cautious of what I say because people say I'm biased because I, I was an artist myself growing up in Peak Skill. So, you know, I, I was a part of the the, the, the organization that uh, Mr. Carney speaks of, the Peak Skill Arts Alliance. And they, they host a, a, weekend, a weekend event every year in June where they have different activities and different restaurants and different local businesses within the city, uh, especially in the downtown area. And it's like a, it's like a two day tour. You get to go from one place to the other. And they've, they've collaborated with the, you know, the Westchester Community College, with PC High School, with Hudson Valley Mocha, you know, and you go to different areas at different times to see different things, you know, different artists performing, visual arts, sculptures, or, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very creative, but, you know, the, the artists in Peace Skill, I've, I've been a part of the, that community for a long time, so I always do what I can to support the, uh, the artists here for sure. Okay, terrific. Thank, thank you so much. Um, why don't we get to to uh, our colleagues' questions here? Um, and uh, just before we start, uh, uh, Claire, is it okay? We, this has been such a great conversation. Is it okay if we we extend it a few more minutes, and so people, you know, Absolutely. so we can get to the question? Great, thank yeah, you. Yeah. If you're willing to stick around, we're willing to stick around with you. So yeah, we'll go beyond uh, twelve fifteen to continue this conversation. Um, so stick around if you can. Is that okay with all with all the panelists here? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I think I'm back. Uh, great. Okay, so I see a question here. How can arts help to revitalize storefront retail? If I could, if I could yeah. Uh, if I could talk to that a little bit. What we do in our development is we uh, take a look at the the commercial space, the retail space, and we. We, we underwrite it at the lowest possible rent. We just underwrite it at a rent just to cover the operating expenses. It's not about the revenue. It's more about getting that, that person, getting that business into downtown. So I think that's vitally important. A lot of the uh, businesses connected with the arts may have uh, you know meager beginnings and, and they need uh, a little help. So I think getting engaged, Leo, goes back to your point before, if they get engaged early enough, um, we can do that. We, we also are working with uh, a, uh, an arts group upstate where it's looking for space. So when we underwrite this with the bank, we take the space and really write it off for practically nothing um, so that it's part of the financial uh, underwriting and we're not counting on that space uh, to to you know, pay down uh, the debt service on the mortgage and so forth. So again, I, I think it's good to get them in early. And then once once that synergy is there between the artists living upstairs, and now you have a connected retail space down there, it makes it so much easier for that connection, for that foot traffic, for that energy and, and connectivity uh, to occur. Yeah. Oh, uh, my, my, oh, I saw Mario, no? Oh. Yes, I would just, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, can oh. you hear me? And now now we can. Okay, great. I, uh, no, I would just add to that and say you know, no. Um can you can hear me? A bit. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you, you might want to turn your video off, I'm sorry, and just see if you can get the sound going. Oh, uh, that? Yeah. Can you say something, Mara? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, all right, uh, Mayor Mayor Rainey, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, no, that's that's perfectly quite, quite uh, all right. Yeah, can, let's see. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. It's like a delay though. Like we can hear you, and then and then after we hear you, your your face had already like uh, smoothed. <laughs> yeah, Mara, I think just just to be you know uh, safe, maybe we just just use your audio. Because that that comes in clearer. So, go ahead, Mara. Great. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, no, I was just saying um, we talked earlier about the need for space for artists, and I think just underscoring what Ken said, which is um, artists need space to create, but they also need audience. So by providing that those spaces on Main Street, you're creating an audience for them, which is uh, you know is part of that much needed uh, component of being an artist um, and creating more foot traffic. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I, I agree with what she said completely. And I'll just you know, give a brief response. You know, as a leadership of the city, 
you know, showing our support to these 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 new businesses is always a benefit to, to, to everyone, you know. And one of the things that we do, of course, is, you know, you do a grand ribbon cutting for every individual business, no matter how big or small it is, um, uh, especially in, in areas like, uh, you know, the, the storefronts of, of, of major buildings. So, and we also, you know, in the city, we try to do it in a, in, in a sense where we do the ribbon cutting, but we allow it to, to be placed on YouTube and on social media. So it's not just a one day ribbon cutting. They can actually share the video with family and friends and, you know, the, the community can circulate it through social media. So if there's anyone who missed the ribbon cutting, they know that this new business is in town, you know. And uh, what we've also tried to do and we're working on doing it now is somewhat of a business directory in the city of Peacekill. So when we do have these new businesses come in, especially the storefront businesses that are, you know, owned and operated by artists, especially, or, you know, small, indiv small individuals or small businesses. We want people to know where they can go when they come into town. So what does the city of Pisco have to offer in our downtown? What type of stores can you find? Can you find clothing stores? Can you find coffee shops? You know, what type of restaurants do we have? When they have a business directory and they can see it, whether it's on our social media, whether it's on our city website or our business improvement district who does a phenomenal job of promoting the city, that helps it all. That helps us all, especially with smaller and smaller businesses. And we want to see these small businesses thrive. So that's that's very vital that we support and we show our ways of doing it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And and I'll just add that un unless we have a V-shaped recovery, which most economists mm -hmm. don't expect, um, mm -hmm. we should expect that there's going to be a number of retail vacancies. Um, also, uh, a smaller demand for office space. Um, so um, the arts, you know, thinking now in terms of providing affordable, at least even if temporary space for arts activities, uh, in you know, uh, will help enhance your your properties. Now, what I will say is uh, one of the big problems, and I know we got to get to the other questions. One of the big problems that that I hear folks in creative placemaker community, artist community, is the artist being the canaries in the coal mine that they're attracted in. And then when the, when the you know, property values go up, they get pushed out. So mm -hmm. we can always expect gentrification, but I would say, I mean, or, or, or that to happen, you know, that's just market dynamics. Yeah. You should, I would say, always plan for success. You know, always plan for that to happen and be prepared so that artists don't, have to be pushed out of your community. So, yeah. anyway, th thank you. I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's good insight, though. Definitely good insight because it's true. It's a concern people do have. And I, you know, just, just briefly, I can say, you know, we we've we've considered that when working with Ken Carney about the, the the artist loft on Main Street. And you know, there's there's things in place to help artists succeed and not be there for a year or two and have to leave, which is great. And I can also say, of all the developers, I've worked with a lot of developers in the past five years, and I can certainly say, uh, Mr. Carney certainly word of what he's done so it's 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 easier to work with developers like that who who care just as much as we care about the artists and people in our community thank you man. Uh, well, so we are affordable for 50 years in all of our developments 50 years so i think 50 years from now i'll just be evolving and hitting my peak so i'm hoping <laughs> there you go <laughs> um th this is great I, I do have to move on i'm sorry um uh so this question from uh grace um do towns or communities do surveys on what spaces are available for arts rehearsals, sharing, or performing? So in the city of Peacefield, we haven't done a survey on art spaces that are available for performing, but we do have uh, a number of places where they can. You know, um, we, we do own the... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Paramount Theater in the city of Peacefield. We have plenty small um, dance rooms right on South Division Street. Um, we also have a, a new proposal for a smaller arts theater that's going to be coming within the next year or two uh, under a developer named Ben Green. And it's going to be a small theater. It's going to be two theaters in one building, a small theater which is going to, going to seat about 55, and another theater is going to seat about 235, I want to say, or somewhere in there. And, um, but, you know, again, that's, that's another reason why having that, that directory would be important. So when artists do come here, they know exactly where they can go for open spaces or for rehearsals. Um, there's also another organization called Just Just the Place. It's a dance organization. They do ballet, they do hip hop, they do you know all types of different dances, and they're they're located a little little further not in the downtown area, but also in Peekskill. But you know, trying to have that directory is what one of the ways that we feel will help benefit people who are looking for those places when they come. Because we haven't had a survey yet. Okay, uh, Ken or Mara, did you want to address that at all or? No. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's always a good idea to do uh, surveys, I would say. Um, and 
by the way, uh, I want to. I forgot to thank Henry Meyerberg for that question about arts helping revitalize storefront retail. Um, I'm just looking to see. There's a few other questions. Um, so the, here's a question specifically for Mara. Uh, can you talk about NISCA's uh, involvement with the AIA and the incredible program you've created? And that's from Sally Baker. Um, you know, that probably would be best answered by the program director um, or uh, architect and design. Uh, but if there's a specific question in there, um, I'd be happy to um, uh, address it now if I can. Otherwise, I'm happy to have uh, Kristen Heron get back to you. Okay. Um, let me just go and, and I'm, these are great, uh, wonderful questions. Thank you so much, everybody. Also, uh, would, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Leo, I just I would just say we have a number of we do provide. A, Leo, can you hear yes, me? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, great. We um, can you um ask um, is it Sally to just uh be specific about which program because we do also provide support to the AIA in a number of ways. Okay, uh, so Sally, if you can, you know, and and any questions we don't get to right now, um. You know, I think we're gonna uh, uh, Claire, we these we're gonna try to answer them in the in the next week or so, right? Is that is am I remembering correctly? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And uh, Mara and Sally, I'd be happy to connect you. We can okay. we can actually absolutely set that up so we can you know flesh this out. Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you, uh, everybody. Um, so here's a question from Lisa Nagel. Uh, it sounds like engaging the arts community is somewhat organic, which is great. Is there a catalyst to this effort? For example, are they involved since project inception? Uh, do they work with the city and developer to shape the project? Um, I think we, I know we've answered that question a little bit, but uh, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like, anybody would like to add. I can, I, I can certainly add, um, if, if that's okay. Uh, so yes. you know, the, the democracy is a beautiful thing. So the the, the process of, of most of these projects, and, and uh, Mr. Carney can speak for his experience, especially especially in the city of Peekskill, is you know every project that gets introduced to the city of Peekskill goes through the council um, first, and it goes to the planning the board, planning board, and zoning board, and the historical uh, his, historical board for their approvals on the um, you know the facade of the actual um, building project. And in all of these um, uh, meetings, we always have to go through a public hearing. So whenever there's a new project that's introduced to the community, um, for, for example, the artist loss, if the artist loss was a big yellow building on Main Street, it would come to the, the planning department. People are allowed to voice their concerns, ask their questions or suggestions at these meetings. And this is in the process that, that gets, it's, it's probably, I wanna say between a six to six month to a year process before any of the actual projects get approved. So every new development that comes to the city, you know, uh, Mr. Carney is working on a project now, like he mentioned earlier, that's gonna have about 200 and something plus uh, mixed, 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 mixed income laws. Like, even though he's presented that now, it's gonna take about a year or so uh, before the project actually starts, you know, dig, digging in the ground, shovels are, are being used. But the process is allowing community engagement. If people are interested, they're welcome to come to the zoning meetings, the planning meetings, and especially the council meetings to voice their concerns or what changes they would like to see, what they do and don't like. So we have a process in place as far as the government goes. Um, the other side of it is also if people have the time, if people are even interested, you know, um, <laughs> then depending on where you live at, you know, your local government, there's a process in place for, for all local municipalities for community engagement for any project that they're presenting. Yeah, I, if I could just follow up, I, I agree with what the, the mayor said. Um, what we encourage as well is for the artist groups to, um, as I said previously, get involved in the DRI process early. If a community is going for a DRI process, if mm -hmm. go for a DRI award, if it's, if it's been awarded a DRI, get involved. However, in our individual uh, developments, we encourage these artist groups, reach out to us. Sometimes, a lot of times during the, the development process and the planning process, we can design a space that's either non-revenue generating or uh, very minimal rent generating, just to get that artist group, to get their presence yeah. into, into our development. And I think it's critical 
uh, to get that to to get that involvement uh, uh, early on. So we're we're looking uh, in some of our upstate projects to get uh, the local artist groups. We want their presence. We want to hear from them, and I think we can give them space in the development. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank thank you. Um, and and Mara, I'll just invite you to jump in whenever you you, you feel. Uh, we've got time for a couple more questions, and I do want to move on to. Uh, we've got a question about fighting gentrification, and we'll, I think we addressed that a little bit. Uh, here's a question that relates to the, the environment we're in now. Um, how can creative placemaking help address the need to reimagine utilization of public spaces and gatherings in a post-COVID environment? So the so the you know as 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 an elected official, <laughs> safety is always the first priority. Um, so fortunately, um, having open spaces and 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 not having the development right on our riverfront has been uh, more utilized now than I think it's ever been in, in you know the entire time that it's that it's been there. And you know we still encourage you know uh, social distancing and wearing a mask. But the fortunate side of it is these artists. And, and I tell people, artists are not just the people that you see in museums and on the concert stage. Like you have artists all over your communities, whether you have an artist community or not, there's artists everywhere. Um, but the artists give us a lot of ideas. So as, as Mr. Carney mentioned earlier, you know, we were successful at receiving a $10 million uh, DRI grant um, last year from the governor. And um, part of that was based on some of the stuff that the governor and, and his um, council has saw in the city of Pisco. In this project, one of the one of the ideas that we had that we would like to spend one of the um, you know a portion of the funds on is creative signage, and of course, where are we getting these ideas from? The, the artists in our community, <laughs> you know, the, the the ideas of what type of signage, what shape of signage, how should the signage, you know, how should it be, how, how should it be designed? There was one idea of having um, the 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 timing signs, which actually tell you how far you are from the next destination. So when you get off the train, it'll say. Peace Hill downtown, seven minutes this way, or Peace Hill library, 11 minutes this way, or Peace Hill Paramount, 14 minutes. Like the creativity of our ideas, a lot of it comes from the actual artists in the community. So when it comes to using open spaces, there's creative ways. They've even decided now that they want to decorate the garbage cans in the, in the in the riverfront area. So people will want to go look at the garbage cans and they can't deny that they see the garbage cans because they look so, for trash cans, beautiful, you know, so. It, it definitely helps out a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ken or Mara, would you like to say anything? Uh, okay, yeah, no, I, I know. Uh, no, I, I think that everything that Andre said. Leo, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, okay. I know, no, I was just going to okay. um, underscore everything that. So what's going on with Mara, just so that we can plow through Mara, what's happening is that you've got a pretty significant delay. So if you start saying something, just you know, plow through. Even if uh, Leo starts to interrupt you, just keep going because there's a delay. So we're not getting that. So um, go ahead, Mara, add on and uh, just plow through. <laughs> go ahead, Mara. Okay, got it. I'm really sorry about this. That uh, we've we've never had this in any of our uh, rehearsals, so apologies. But um, talk about the times we live in. So uh, I was just going to uh, really just um, second everything that Mayor Rainey said. Uh, artists can be the most creative, and and everyone has creativity in them in some way. And so uh, even what um, the mayor said about you know where art can uh, be quote unquote exhibited or in fact originate in and on uh, conventional places, you know, we saw that uh, or seeing that um, in Albany with the um, artists at the Albany Barn who are partnering with the Albany Parking Authority to build murals across the parking structures. Really super right. cool. Yeah. And, you know, and everything that um, the mayor said is just the really extension of those kinds of works. Right. Um, yeah, uh, one of the great things I found about working with artists is when they're motivated motivated when they're engaged when they feel respected um they'll come up with a million you don't have to tell them what to do they'll come up with a million ideas the hard part yeah. of working with artists is they'll come up with a million ideas <laughs> <laughs> um uh claire and jean do we have time for one more question here yep one more 
Okay, um, so here's a question, uh, and, and these are all, uh, I, I wish we had more time to, these are ter such terrific questions here. Um, but let's let's talk about, um, uh, this is a question about how to get, from Grace, uh, how to get a municipality to buy into even just a few of these ideas? You know, uh, places that don't have a, a history of, you know, of a, a, a public arts, Mm -hmm. community. You know, you know? I, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And I, and I think it's, you know, like I said, this this stem from, as an artist, I've, I've always felt that we should look out for artists. So put, putting me in position was definitely a good step. But what I will say is um, it, it was a vision idea that came from, you know, mayors prior to my time. You know, uh, like I said, Mayor Fran Gibbs, her idea was we can turn the city of Peekskill into a diverse, a very diversified city. But we also wanna make sure that we have a little bit more creativity here. So she had this vision of bringing artists into the city. And I think that when people actually speak about the, or and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say compare, but when people actually speak about or show the difference of, differences of, of communities who have thrived through their art, artist community versus you know, other cities and towns, I think you'll see a, a, a significant difference in the um the the character of the of the town and i tell people all the time you know it's artists are not just the ones on the state like this i think every community has a good amount of different artists maybe some artists artists publicly expressive yet or because it's not a public city or town they haven't been out there as much there as often i mean once we brought artists loves to peak skill so many artists i mean from brooklyn from from florida you know from all over the world are living in peak skill and when you can share these type of stories, you know, I think that helps initiate the progress. It helps initiate the conversation. So I was I was certainly start off with seeing if it's possible to even start a small organization of artists in that city or town that you're in, just to see how many artists you already have there. You know, the Peace Guild area, we have Peace Guild Arts Alliance, and there's, there's about 200 and something members at one point, uh, just in that organization. And then they push forward, you know, we want to see more artist laws, we want to see more artist activities, we want to see more festivals, we want to see more open space land with, with sculptures, and we want to see more creative signage, and the, the, the contribution from the artists now is probably better than it's ever been, but it did start, you know, it did start, uh, you know, I want to say over a decade ago with just the idea of it, so if, if there's a group of people in that community that she's in, um, Grace is her name, uh, if she's in the area where there's a group of people, just get together and see how many people you can, you know, you can gather that are actually artists or that are willing to contribute to help artists thrive in your city, and then take it from there and meet with your, your, your Mr. Car Mr. Carneys, and then meet with your local elected officials and you know uh, investors and see what they would like to do to go forward. Great, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have about a minute, so Ken or Mara, do you do you yeah, want to say anything? If I could just uh, follow up on that, uh, as always, the Mayor, you're a very tough act to follow. I find that, <laughs> but uh, 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 it's been an absolute joy and pleasure working with you, Mayor. Your uh, your your synergy, uh, energy, and, and uh, your your vision for Peekskill uh, is is unprecedented. Uh, what I would encourage Thank other you. communities to do is to do your homework. In Oneonta, they put 16 people on a school bus and came down from Oneonta to Peekskill because they wanted to see not just the lost on Main. They wanted to see the artist community. And they stopped and they went over and they interviewed people. Uh, Lockport, uh, half a dozen people came down and they visited two or three of our uh, projects and met with people in the artist community and say, how can we get this started? Uh, Rome has done their homework. The other communities we're working in are making phone calls now and, and they're looking for, for tips. How do we get started? And what happens is once the snowball gets going downhill, it just picks up speed. It does. And what I found with the artists, is a lot of communities may not realize it, but they're out there. And it's a bunch of loose strings that are out there. And it's our job to pull them all together and get them in one place to make an impact. And so that that would be my suggestion to a community. Do your homework, take a road trip, get some tips, and get started. Great. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Mara, I can give you the last word here if you want it. Sure. Um, so I just going to, uh, you know, I second everything that everyone said, and I think it's really about exposure and education. And, and, and it's something that even at NISCA, you know, we're constantly challenged, which is 
the fact that, um, you know, early on in this country's history, the arts were so much associated with wealth, whether there was wealthy people, wealthy places. And now what we really know is that arts are critical to health, to health of people and to health of those places. And, and so, and that is a, a story we, and, and the examples that we cite over and over and over again. And the, the more we can get that out, the more we can shift people's um, uh, perception or, or preconceptions about who's an artist, who's not an artist, that creativity really lives in all of us, and that arts actually drive these healthy and make healthy communities. Great, and and on that point, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ken uh, Ken Carney, Mayor Andre Rainey, uh, Mara Manas, uh, and of course, thank you to our organizers who brought us together, uh, Claire Weston and Jean Hammerman. Uh, so, uh, Claire, back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for uh, sticking with us. This has been so excellent. Um, I really hope that you enjoyed our speakers' comments as much as I did. I just want to um, say a couple last-minute things. Um, this summit is far from over. Uh, don't I know it? <laughs> but I'm enjoying every minute, so I want to encourage you to join our office hours this afternoon at 2, getting shovel ready, marketing your properties and opportunity zones and beyond. Uh, that kind of can tie in with this. Um, you know, showing the arts in your community, uh, putting your community's assets on display with a marketing sheet is a key part of the redevelopment process. So we're going to talk a lot about that. Here's from some great people. Um, Join Info is here on the slide. You can download this slide deck in your handout section of the dashboard. Um, and I do really want to encourage all of you to continue the conversation in the LinkedIn networking group and tag the speakers specifically um, so that we can get some of these conversations or continue some of these conversations. We've already had great conversations. Um, some of the questions that we didn't get to, you can post them in the LinkedIn group. We can answer them there. Um, alternatively, we will be collecting all of those questions, um, reviewing them, getting some, uh, some uh, responses back from our speakers, and then uh, sending out those questions and responses in the next few weeks. Okay, and uh, I just want to again thank you. This is uh, the, the contact information for our Seek Your Senior team, so please reach out to us at any point. And um, again, thank you to our wonderful, wonderful speakers. We're so pleased that you uh, all could join us today. This was a really phenomenal conversation. And uh, I will see all of you for the, for the rest of the summit. Enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the week. Thank you. And uh, yeah. Enjoy. Thank you so right, much. Thank you. Thanks for having Bye. us. Much appreciated. Everyone take care and be safe out there. You too.